Recently, a British woman was arrested for theft. She had taken spoiling food, primarily meat, specifically ham, thrown out by a Tesco supermarket after a power outage. After her arrest, Mrs. Hall, that was her name, said, quote, Tesco clearly did not want the food. They dumped it, and rather than see it go to waste, I thought I could help feed me and my family for a week or two, end quote. However, in the case of Hall v. Tesco, the shops of the contents of the bin belonged to them, even though it had been tossed out. And we should note, Tesco has stated that they work to, quote, minimize waste and where possible to seek to reuse and recycle it. Uh, of their green measures, the most notable is the fact that every year they send thousands of pounds of leftover meat to be burned for electricity. Unsurprisingly, this is true. Unsurprisingly, property as a relation is thicker than hunger as caloric need. And the material fact of having been discarded isn't enough. As a property lawyer commented on the case, quote, it isn't enough to throw it out. One needs to intend to abandon it. Although this is wrong, as intention alone won't cover it, it is owned straight through the process of decomposition until the ham goes green and liquefies, until it pools in a sludge at the bottom of the bin, seeping a bit out into the street on which there are bodies that have little meat and less work. That declaration of property and potential valorization is a form that clings to its object beyond any transformation of matter. Barring one, only exchange, only MC, and exchange between two parties can affect this belonging. Without circulation, it cannot go properly unowned, even as it goes unvalued, wet, and reeking. There is a tie that binds beyond the weave of Sarcomer. And all the more, as it does not rot, it burns. Not charred in a grill, not consumed in the furnace of a body, but burned, plain and simple. Like the raising of food to be eaten by those who could work, this is caloric expenditure in the name of productive energy, yet without having to route back through living labor and all its complaints and requests, just straight back into circulation, maintenance, upkeep, and reproduction, into the electrical circuits, for example, that keep the Tesco lights burning white to bathe the rest of the unbought meat as if in blue milk, where it waits to be burned and never to be disowned. So it's there in this triangulation between one, the rotting ham letting loose caloric energy into an inedible puddle, between two, her attempt to feed herself and her family, to take in calories in order to keep living, thereby requiring more activity to be undertaken to gather more calories, and between three, the next batch of meat to come, which will require energy and exertion to maintain it, to get it turned into money, and perhaps energy, before it is fully devalorized. It's this triangulation that I want to address. For the sake of clarity, I did this. For the sake of clarity, this is from uh, 1916, so I'm addressing only a single text at length, namely Marx's 1857 to 1858 notebooks, gathered as the Grunnery, so I'm not interested in the least in proving or disproving or, you know, calling for a return to Marx in any shape or form, only that the hot mess that is the Grunnerisa, inconsistent, wild, and provocative as it still is, is the occasion for these thoughts, although I think they bear beyond it. To add a specific framing to the target, uh, to my target along with the one I share with Ben to a degree, my target, I think, is that tendency which understands our living labor as an originary vital force of praxis and material transformation hemmed in, restrained, and dominated by the form of the wage relation, yet which remains always in excess to it, a boundless potential bent and pent up by the chronometrics and abstractions of value. As my title indicates, I'll approach this via three main notions, labor, form, and meat, or substance, in the less necro version. Uh, as will become clear, I'm not substan substantively engaging with vitalism as a philosophical tradition, but I'm countering a set of notions, I hope, that still, after all these years, after all this blithering idiocy of the last few centuries, still wants to valorize labor as something worth doing, and life as something worth dying for. So let us get back to meat, um, to a footnote later in the Green Reset. Quote, in regard to the production phase, especially circulation time, note that use value itself places limits upon it. Wheat must be reproduced in a year. Perishable things like milk, etc., must be reproduced more often. Meat on the hoof does not need to be reproduced quite so often, since the animal is alive and hence resists time. But slaughtered meat on the market has to be reproduced in the form of money in a very short time, or it rots. End quote. To be alive, meat on the hoof, rather than just meat, or meat in itself, if you wish, is to resist time, to reproduce oneself as a continuation of life, to stave off another reproduction, a reproduction that will liquefy frozen form, rot being the failure of circulation, that is, just as much as not decomposing, i.e. the frozen horde, would be, in that it isn't a reproduction, transposition, and accumulation, 
through initial decomposition of the value bound in one form into another. Money, of course, though, is just such a correct liquidation, the necessary one. It's the universal commodity that bridges decomposition and recomposition. More prosaically, it's just a way to keep said meat animated after the fact, to recoup its loss and recuperate its generative potential via, I don't know, kind of four stages of meat. One, the preservation of the meat. Money exchange for refrigeration. Let me see if I have more meat. Well, this will work for the moment. Money exchange for refrigeration. Workers to make sure that no one shoplifts a rack of beef, butchers to cut meat into small pieces. Two, the monetary consumption of the meat. Cash exchange before the point of no return, sell by date. Meat as a vector or medium for other activities involving money, unwaged work of cooking, energy bought to grill it up. Three, optional stage, uh, the physical consumption of the meat. Caloric energy frozen in that meat is processed, albeit by an initial caloric expenditure of chewing and cutting, and thereby reproduces the potential labor power of the eater, and if unused, it'll kind of gather around the body conveniently for later. And four, the last would be the application of that meat energy. That would be the, the, the calories used by the one who ate it, thereby joining the X life of the meat with the life of the human meat on the hoof, uh, busy resisting time of raw. So as marked by the optional status of these last two, the mode of the meat's destruction is utterly irrelevant, provided that the first two conditions occur. It's supposed to get plowed back into circulation, not just as money, but also as caloric input into the reproduction of a body, preferably one that might do some work. But it does not matter, only that it has been reproduced, that is to say, utterly transformed. It might seem then that we, humans, I guess I don't need quotes in that, we humans, are the exception here, not only because we are the source of value, rather because we are, in general, they whose reproduction requires a preservation of that existing thing in its distinct life and form. Read, body able to sell labor power, perhaps actually expend some energy towards a hypothetically productive end, the economic subject getting paid, and the point of transfer through which money passes and tweets. Would that it were so, though, our reproduction as subset of the circulation and accumulation of capital cares not a whit about the preservation of these specific things, these individual bodies. We are. No, what matters is only the perpetuation of the life of these things in general. And that's the core of the difference between living labor and labor power. It is always a distinct I. It's always a distinct I who does the laboring. But what is exchanged is labor power as such in a prescribed duration of time. I think this is a key difference to be stressed and clarified. So I'll let David Harvey do that, because he's better than I am. So, quote, there is, in Marxist theory, therefore, a vital distinction between labor and labor power. Labor, Marx asserts, is the substance and imminent measure of value, but has itself no value. What the laborer sells to the capitalist is not labor, the substance of value, but labor power, the capacity to realize in commodity form a certain quantity of socially necessary labor time. End quote. And I want to mark the substance of value. This is the key thing I'm going to return to here. But if the point drawn out is the gap between the labor performed, the quantity of that universal measure, and the capacity to generate value, this gives a certain optic on the strength of the historical workers' movement in its apexes and nadirs, namely in the degree to which it tried to insist on the inseparability of these two things, insisting that labor power not be understood via a general calculation of the factory's total hours of socially necessary potential surplus labor, but in terms of the concrete labor, the conditions and length of working days, and the caloric social requirements of these specific laborers. This is, in short, to tie, lab to tie labor to the lives of distinct instances of the working class, not the life of the class, and all those else without reserves, as an aggregate. Yet this direction of the workers' movement produced in its very success, success such as putting the brakes in the continued extension of the working day, a major stumbling block. That is, in binding the calculation of the wage to the costs of reproducing those individual workers, and in certain periods, say, U.S. continental Europe from mid-19th century to the 1960s, generally including wife and children, part of that cost as well. And so doing, it forfeited the possibility of a more equivalent and ultimately disruptive caloric calculation, namely between the living labor expended and the total costs of the reproduction of that labor power, which necessarily includes, one, the continued existence of those who are not employed as downward pressure on the wage, who have to be kept alive in order to threaten the wage and its work, and two, the continued existence of those who literally reproduce the species and frequently wipe its asses, namely women. Such that insisting on the rights of workers, it necessarily accepted a far lower amount of remuneration than requisite for the continued life of the class as a whole. 
And this isn't to assert a counterfactual or to venture that it was historically possible to do so, although given the counterpublic sphere, emerging workers' club, self-organized class welfare, and the union in its widest incarnation in the industrial and Fordist period, we can nevertheless, nevertheless glimpse a different trajectory that in fact would demand wages for the class as a whole, or at least of a region or a company, rather than individual workers, an amount that can only be higher than tally of the plausible wages of those actually employed. Such a notion was posed briefly in sort of Italian long 70s, though ultimately the obsession with the wage didn't serve them well, particularly since what it describes is compelling only insofar as it ruptures the very category of wage by the impossibility of this demand rather than extending it to all and sundry. Clearly, none of this came to pass, and therein the disavowal on the part of the workers' movement of the necessary function for capital of those who do not work and who are merely alive. By not focusing on their cause as part of the calculation of the wage, the workers' movement could not adequately conceive of the total cost of reproduction of life, of value, and the gray areas in between. However, the impetus remained initially correct for a system in which there are not slaves, i.e. workers as fixed capital. And despite the attempts to yoke together labor power as a form in time, with the expendable capacity to work of those who did, or to join together a laboring life with living labor as a mass of exertion irrespective of the divisions of this or that body which can live or die if work too hard, it remains a real structuring separation. Because unlike, say, a bandsaw in a factory, which indeed aids the production of value and circulation of capital, or any saw is fine, uh, yet insofar as it is reproduced or maintained with electricity, new parts and living labor poured through it, it's in the name of this particular bandsaw continuing to work and do its job. Because it's already been bought in full, it's in the interest of its owner that this very distinct instantiation of the category of bandsaw keep functioning as long as it performs competitively. You're not interested in the fact that there are other bandsaws that could be employed if your one that you are paid for breaks down. It must, therefore, be cared for to telescope, of course, the general perspective of capital wants, the immediate immolation of all bandsaws so as to build more. I want to pause here on this saw and its relation to those who use or get used by it to mark briefly the relation to automation here. And this is a far longer account that can be given, but it retains a shape in this sketch. Namely, in my reading of Capital, and I think one that's borne out elsewhere, and the long account given of the development of the full machinic assembly of the factory, Marx lays out how, initially, and in line with formal subsumption, the technology employed was that which didn't fundamentally disrupt the flows of handicraft. It mined, this is how he speaks about it, it mined that manual work, an equivalent tool or productive organ um, to the machine of worker plus tool as sort of a unit of work there. Such that the worker still functioned as the transmission mechanism and the motive force, the latter of which to be quickly replaced, of course, by the Promethean power of coal and steam, etc. Thus to say it's an imitation of labor. Once set in motion, the machine, quote, performs the same tools, sorry, with its tools, the same operations as the worker formerly did with similar tools, end quote. Yet as more complex factory flows developed, which distanced further from the organization of bodies and materials inherited from craft production, the similar tool in question came to be the laborer herself, inserted into the machinic process as if mere implement, the pace and rhythm um, of labor time forced into accordance with that set by the factory. And what this means, in short, is that living labor comes to imitate the machine to ape its speed and patterns. Given that the machine was, first and foremost, an imitation of living labor, Factory work is, it turns out, an imitation of imitation of living labor. In my immediate context, it's the general dynamic that's of particular interest, in which a form of structuring productive time emerges first as a description and imitation of a set of material processes. It does not remain a labile, recapturing, uh, recalibrating capture adequate to the heterogeneous material that falls beneath its sign. Rather, it unfolds its own formal logic, becoming instead uh, is structuring abstraction such that, in the case it's described, machinic labor comes to ape the working machines and their initial incarnation and ape that of relatively skilled humans. So even human machine or something. In the present context, though, there's two versions of giving form that I want to bring out regarding living labor, versions which ultimately can't be separated, and especially not, that should be stressed, in a version of passive and active, but a very flat, shitty version. So first, in a rather infamous turn of phrase, quote, Labor is the living, form-giving fire. It is the transitoriness of things, their temporality, as their formation by living time, end quote. 
Accounts concerned to locate a liberatory potential in the liberation of labor from the constraints of value find much ammo here, as it accords with the general sense of the creative potential to remake the world in our, uh, in our image, such that all it would take uh, to turn the productive apparatuses off their current course and into fluid, nomadic, experimental, blah, blah. Okay, let's leave that here. Okay, second, the other form of form giving. Quote, labor also is consumed by being employed and set into motion. And a certain amount of the worker's muscular force is thus expended so that he exhausts himself. But labor is not only consumed, but also at the same time fixed, converted from the form of activity to the form of the object, materialized as a modification of the object. It modifies its own form and changes from activity to being." End quote. And this description of the development of the product as frozen concretion is not opposed to the first formal mode of labor, insofar as it represents the turn of the dialectical sprue, and insofar as it gives back into that line of argument which understand the first mode as primary or originary, falsely captured by the commodity form and its material output. However, there is in Marx another way to grasp the emergence of form that comes closer to articulating the fundamental tendency of what someone like Zone Rettel uh, speaks about in terms of real abstraction. And let me take an even more notorious example, which I'm way too fond, from the poverty of philosophy, in which Marx writes, Time is everything, man is nothing. He is, at most, time's carcass. And this appears initially as just a conveniently catastrophic metaphor, as good as it is. But there's two relevant interpretations here. One, okay, first, in a sort of looser, more standard one, that takes it primarily as just a ramped up modifier of the preceding sentence about one man's labor is equivalent to another man's labor over the set time, etc. In this sense, man is time's carcass, and that man's specificity is killed, leaving man a carcass animated by value and made to labor, simply a material unit of potential activity subordinated to labor time. That is, man is as if dead labor. Two, if we recall the particular dialectic of form and content in Marx, we approach a different perspective. The act of development by the laboring of man as labor power, the content, produced the material conditions for labor time, the form. However, of course, the perversity of capital is that this form does not remain adequate to its content. It becomes divorced from it, increasingly autonomous. But if this is not for me a form, uh, excuse me, a story of a form that simply takes leave from content and becomes everything or is merely dominant, rather it determines the content in a relentless passage back and forth to force it to accord with this divorced development such that any opposition between form and content becomes increasingly incoherent. And as such, man is time's carcass in that labor power is valued only in accordance with its form. It is that formal relation of exchange, fully developed in the general equivalence of value, alone which is of worth. Man, as that which labors, as the material grounding of that form, is a husk dominated by an abstraction with no single inventor. Okay, very well. Uh, what of that carcass, or perhaps this carcass here? Uh, I'll get, this is the exciting stuff I'll get to in a minute. Let me leave this here for a minute. What of that carcass? What of substance? As mentioned previously and throughout Marx's work, the most common notion of the substance of value is labor, and that largely unspecified living or objectified labor. And uh, the most general substance, of course, in terms of labor time, that forms the measure of all value here. So substance, though, is an unruly and slippery notion in Marx's thought. Uh, consider elsewhere in the Grundrisse, where money is both Gemeinswesen, uh, the real community, and the, quote, general substance of survival. And more widely, substance is, I'd argue, one of the ways that Marx is able to think through an impasse in thought, an impasse that gives fundamental shape to the relations of capital. Namely, how are we to square capital's indifference to particular material form while nevertheless producing a set of limits and strictures in which the range of formal expressions of matter are, on the one hand, radically heterogeneous, and on the other, utterly interchangeable? Substance is the subtending that allows for this emergence and flattening, the realm of formal potential and also potential forms. In the Grundrisse, though, there's two notions of substance raised powerfully. First, there's the communal substance of all commodities, i.e. their substance not as material stuff, as in Marx's words, as physical character, but their communal substance as commodities, and hence exchange values, is this, that they are objectified labor. So substance one is objectified labor. While this determination is not material and the character not physical, it appears in that present as, a, as present in space, as opposed to living labor, which he says is present in time. Space-time turns out to be then just degrees of living labor. However, labor in the present cannot sustain itself untethered from something that lives, i.e. us, uh, for it must be present not as a mass of labor, that would be objectified or dead labor, but as a present capacity. 
And so we have this other form here, which I'm going to get to, another substance that emerges. Quote, for the use value which he offers, he, the man who labors, excuse the constant gender in Marx's language, exists only as an ability, a capacity of his bodily existence, has no existence apart from that. The labor objectified in that use value is the objectified labor necessary bodily to maintain not only the general substance in which the labor power exists, i.e. the worker himself, but also that required to modify this general substance, the bodily general substance, so as to develop its particular capacity. So the second substance at hand, the second general substance, is that of the flesh and bones of the worker, quite literally, the bodily frame that is the medium, matter, and basic content to be developed, shaped, and betrayed by the specific form living labor takes. We need to account for the precise relationship between these two substances, and this is an aspect I've yet to make explicit, though it's going to be familiar to people. Namely, the real purpose of living labor is to preserve, maintain, and animate the dead, objectified, past living labor that absorbs it. Living labor is employed in that race against time and rock of meat uh, off the hoof and on the hook. For left alone, objectified living labor is, quote, a mere thing at prey of processes of chemical decay. And in a very crucial passage, I'm going to read this out, Marx says, the dissolution to which its substance, here meaning literal material that can decay, is prey, therefore, sorry, is prey to that which therefore dissolves the form, material form, and also value at the same time when it rots, clearly can be sold as well. However, when they are posited as conditions of living labor, they are themselves reanimated. Objectified labor ceases to exist in a dead state as an external, indifferent form of the substance because it is again posited as a moment of living labor. The point, then, is not merely that living labor reawakens the value embedded in objectified labor as raw materials or instruments of production which transfer value across the duration they exist, right? It's not just a relation of present labor toward past labor. Um, it goes in the other direction as well, as objectified labor is posited materially as a moment of living labor. And elsewhere, Marx speaks of this as the living quality of preserving objectified labor time by using as the objective conditions. So in short, the condition of living labor is that of dead labor as such. So while living labor adds a new value to the old one, maintains it, eternizes it, he says, it's far from a unidirectional process. And rather, there's a total collapse of the dividing wall between the two zones. The process of production is an indistinct muddling of living and dead labor. How am I doing for time, by the way? Okay. Okay. What I want to propose is that if I'm like if I have five minutes left, I'm going to yeah, yeah, Okay. Yeah. What I want to propose is that we can start to venture a third general substance. This is not a Copernican turn, I just want to draw out this sort of unspoken part of Marx. A third general substance between that of the worker, that of the baseline of literal flesh and that of value, i.e. objectified living labor, that is, labor done in the past. And the third general substance, which is the meat of my argument, the meat in question, not the content, is the terrain of living labor as the impossible mediation, a relation formalized in the shape of labor power between these two. It is, in short, the expenditure of life in the name of holding off the rotting of life already spent in the past. It is an imminent relation with an increasingly blurry line of living labor to itself, imminent, sorry, living labor imminent to itself in two modes, objectified and present. And it incorporates at once, sorry, I'm losing my iPadding space here, at once those two other general substances, the reproducing bodies of the working class and the materially fixed and piled up remainders of past labor, which need constant reproduction in terms of maintenance, more living labor, and the transfer of their value. And let me note quickly that this is just not this is not just a problem for meat theorists. Uh, it also represents a difficulty for political economy in the calculation of the value composition of capital. Namely, at what point in the production cycle do you stop considering living labor with its rate of surplus value? Of course, it comes to that as living. And as these two charts show here, we have uh, this one here, and this is the one which kind of you have living labor, and then at the end where you're treating it as already fixed capital because it's bought. It's already. It's already objectified in this sort of second stage of this. It's treated as objectified living labor, and therefore it no longer has the capacity to produce surplus value. Though, of course, this was at this point. So you have a different composition of capital relative and absolute as opposed to here. Um, and they show two very different portraits of that. It's actually sort of a problem, quantitative problem here. Okay. 
Here we can double back around towards some more crucial general positions. Okay, one, recall first that what's particular about the generative power of living labor is not that it produces more use values, or that it bears any resemblance other than coincidence to production of materials that would help those people who labor live. The point of living labor is just that it produces surplus value. And as such, when considered in terms of the third general substance, living labor's total medium, et cetera here, we gain a very different portrait of living labor that cuts against the dominant fantasy that is a generative potential to be freed from the regime of value. Namely, it is living labor not because it is active and not because those who labor are living. It is because it makes what is already dead almost live again. And that's the specificity of living labor. Of course, this substance involves things that seem, at least politically and juridically, very different on the one hand living human beings and on the other hand dead and non-human material. And it is there that we see just how they relate in the inversion of care for those things. For while it matters the objectified living labor already present in the factory be maintained, the saw of which I spoke, for living laborers this is flatly not the case from either a local or a system-wide perspective. It's of no grand importance if a particular one breaks down and it just slows down circulation to have to keep it running. By it, I mean bodies of humans via the existence of political pressures to keep manufacturing at home or strikes, things like that. And especially when there are new, cheaper models elsewhere, re Asia, Latin America, the global south. What matters is the reproduction of labor power in general, both in its local instance, the labor pool in a particular zone, and in its global scale, the hypothetically employable portion of the species. So while it demands that there be particular workers, obviously there's no such thing as labor power without particular bodies who labor, it is opposed violently to them in their particularity. And instead, it is only in the name of the human in general, and in a very, very perverse analog to the incorrect demand that communism be the flowering of the universal or of the common, the reproduction requirement of living labor is the name of A, past life of the collective, the maintenance and remobilization of spent labor, and B, life to come, the general expansion of the ranks of the species, i.e. things that could contribute living labor. But it is directly and far from accidentally opposed to the upkeep of the individual humans who make up part of the species that labors productively. And it is opposed to the continued animation of the individual humans that make up the other part that does not produce value. And all this to say is that living labor is literally, and not just sort of figuratively in terms of capital being bad or degrading, opposed to particular lives. For it is only the name of a generalized life, a substance that is ultimately, as I've said before here, off the hook, off the hook, but not yet on the hook. Uh, I was going to speak about a horror film, but I'm probably running out of time, so let me, let me conclude. If I can speak to this later here. Um, sort of exciting, but, but do I have five? Or? Yeah, you can have five minutes. All right, let me just then say this very quickly. Um, I want to briefly just, actually, no, sorry, that'll be too long. Let me be nice to people. Okay, regarding them, um, I just want to speak about why I've spoken about meat, and then I want to talk about Lord Byron very quickly. It seems better, I think. And it's for this reason, broadly, that I'm speaking about meat. For as opposed to flesh, meat designates that which is not alive, and which is destined or intended to participate in the reproduction of life. It is to be consumed. More than that, the word meat is etymologically linked in English, at least, to the notion of measure. It is in this way the general substance of labor living and lived in various degrees of animation across which our time is splayed out. We're part of an order of being in which it is neither the reproduction of what resists time, nor the suspended pseudo-animation that pose between money and rot. Rather, it's the continual reproduction of slaughtered meat, in a certain sense. Their living labor is never self-generating this way. Regarding the political stakes, I want to buck the natural progression of this kind of talk in which I give a prescription for what communist thought needs to do, or worse, for the left, in part because I don't think meat theory is particularly applicable to the ranks of people thinking about the left these days. But I will say this very briefly, that insofar as there might be a political upshot of my comments, I actually don't tell something Ben said, um, contra Bernbaum, but I think in a very different way I'm coming from, which is that it's high time to further sever the ties between labor and communist thought. And not because those who work are remotely excluded from real struggles and seizure and appropriation, rather because as far as communism bears a relationship and commitment to any sense of life, it isn't really plowed back into circuits of reproduction. It bears it to a fully contradictory life. It insists on the end products of labor, i.e., we want food, we want roofs, and we want medicine, yet which refuses to play the dwindling game of living labor. And it certainly won't be a new mode of production, and not a new society either. The only sure thing is it will be very messy. 
So on the note of mess, let me end with, um, with Byron here, further back in the 19th century than the Grundrisse, with Byron's song to the Luddites, sent in a letter to Thomas More on December 24th, 1816. I love the thought this is what he was writing the day before Christmas, because it's pretty cheery. <laughs> Quote, are you not near the Luddites? By the Lord, if there's a row, I'll be among ye. How go on the weavers, the breakers of frames, the Lutherans of politics, the reformers? And then here's his poem included. As the liberty lads o'er the sea bought their freedom and cheaply with blood, so we boys, so we will die fighting or live free, and down with all kings but King Lud. When the web that we weave is complete, and the subtle exchange for the shuttle exchanged for the sword, we will fling the winding sheet, which is a, a burial shroud. We will fling the winding sheet o'er the desolate at our feet, and die it deep in the gore he has poured. Though black as his heart its hue, since his veins are corrupted to mud, yet this is the dew which the tree shall renew of liberty planted by lud. And amazing quote here. Of course, if we read with a close eye, what is the actual horror here? It's the slipping hinge between, quote, the gore he has poured and the black heart of the machine, the despot, with its veins corrupted to mud. That is, the dying of the shroud, black, is done in the gore already spilled, that is, the lives destroyed in the course of being employed as living labor, not in that of the slain master. The shroud is not oil slipped, for example. No, it is dyed in the dying that had been happening, such that even at the point of the despot machine's death, it lies cloaked in the winding sheet that was the very product it made all along, from absorption of labor power in the name of production to the sopping up of life lost in the name of the, balking, excuse me, the mocking burial of what never lived. But if it is not its blood, but our own in which it has died, then we too must have the same black hearts, though black is his heart, its hue. That busted pump that shoves our cheap gore around the overworked veins, that same general flesh of labor, and so, to truly exchange shuttle for swords, we would lay ourselves down next to a slain machine, pull the wet shroud over us all, tuck us all in, and open a vein. That is, let the living bury themselves as and with their dead. Thanks.